Today we're going to talk about the uh, art of workflow and what does that mean? Um, we have probably heard that word a lot here already today and I want to at least kind of take a second to at least acknowledge what that's all about. Um, so we throw around the word workflow when we're trying to refer to the, the steps we take to get to a goal, right? So um, a workflow can be very simple or it can be very complex. It could be a lot of steps or very few steps. Um, but the idea is that you're conscious of those steps you're following and you do them to arrive at a destination. So um, for anyone who just came in, there's tons of seats up front. I know no one wants to be that person, but hey, plenty of seats. So yeah, so with, with the art of workflow, my, my thought here was that there's a lot of people who've opened Keyshot, they've gotten through it, but maybe they don't use it often enough to really find themselves into a bit of a, um, a rhythm or, or this kind of reproducible kind of do this, do that. So the idea uh, with the, the art of workflow is that we would kind of look at the steps that we can follow to best manage our time from beginning to end. And the, there's a few benefits to that. If we can manage our time and kind of know the steps we follow, we can consciously, um, we can do a better job of estimating how long a project will take. This is beneficial if you're employed by somebody and you want to tell them when something will be finished. It also is helpful if you're somebody um, who runs a business and you provide a rendering service to somebody else and you want to quote a project, you want to know A, how long it's going to take you to complete and B, when you can turn it into your customer or client. So again, I think there's a lot more um, there's a lot of benefits that can be gained by actually thinking about the steps you take. It's kind of like the old adage, you know, give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend four hours sharpening my axe, that type of thing. So what we're going to do is take a look at what steps we might take and how we can best manage our time. Okay, so if this is the first workshop of mine that you've sat in, my name is Will Gibbons. If it's the second or third, I'm so sorry, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, but yeah, so if we haven't met before, say hi before the end of the conference. I enjoy meeting all of you and I, I really appreciate, appreciate you guys coming here. Um, I'm the Global Training Specialist for Luxion. That means I've spent the last couple of years doing on-site training for groups. I help designers and engineers and teams of designers and engineers pick their level of rendering up to, um, or their competence up to a level that they're satisfied with. And um, I'm now, just as of recent, relocated out here to the West Coast from the East Coast. Um, if you guys do have questions, though, if you have uh, troublesome scenes or, or generic questions or anything, shoot me an email at will at luxion.com, and I'd be happy to help or find the right person to help you guys out. So um, I come from a product design background, so process and uh, this concept of design thinking and always identifying a goal instead of just wasting time on the computer. Yes, I do that too. Um, but no, I, I, try, I really try to think about, like, where am I going? What are the objectives? How do I get there? Because again, time is the enemy. We always want to be as quick as we can and be conscious of where our time's going. And that's heavily what this is based on. So um, those are just some images I've done lately. I, um, I, I went, you know, I learned um, design skills. I went to school for design. After that, I went on the West Coast out here to do some work for a cycling company. And then um, after a while, I wanted to get back into more, more uh, hardcore design stuff, so I did I did design um, as a consultant for a few years. During that process, though, I did learn that I, I got frustrated with some things, but I really enjoyed other parts, and those parts I really enjoyed were the rendering aspects. It was just, it was fun to put the polish on the thing that you spend a bunch of time designing or modeling or, or whatever. So um, today I, I really like helping people make images that help tell a story, explain an idea, convey an emotion because again at the end of the day no one cares about a pretty image like that's uh, that's great but like I believe we can offer some depth and context to an idea and, and do that with our rendering so uh, okay so without further ado that's kind of my whole my whole take on the imagery um, and rendering but today we're going to talk about this concept of a three pass technique um, this isn't some you know crazy philosophical thing that I'm claiming to have made up, but it is something that I, I guess subconsciously over the years I've found myself doing over and over again. So I just decided to kind of formalize it and package it up for this session. So block in, lock in, and refine. Um, that's kind of the three steps that I'm, I'm going to look at today and we're going to talk about. So um, this will differ from the previous workshops I did in that I'm not going to go through the presentation, then go into Keyshot. I'm going to try to go back and forth and hopefully we can fit it in 
before we run out of time. So let's talk about these three phases. So block in, blocking in is all about making quick decisions to establish what an image will look like, but not getting hung up on the details, okay? So these are like the broad strokes of painting. If you've ever painted, you want to kind of choose the, the big blocks of, of uh, splotches of paint where the light colors are going, where the dark colors are going, things like that. Then you spend time kind of locking it in. This means you start committing to ideas or details about the image that are going to help make it more realistic and believable. And then when we refine it, this is where we're going to go in and ideally we want to gather objective critical feedback from somebody we trust. And then we spend time implementing their feedback to then enhance our image. And that's kind of this, this idea. So this is kind of like having your fellow artist critique your painting and then you go in and just touch it up a little bit. So these are the three phases. This is how I think of them. And, um, and this is what we're going to try to, to follow through example here. So beginning with the block in, this is one step that almost everybody skips or misses, and I call it the scene audit. Um, and so if you have had training by me, you might have heard me talk about this before. And this is where we take a moment to just assess our scene. And by this, I mean, let's look at our geometry and see if it has any issues on import. Like I, last week, I did a model where literally for no reason something was coming in with a missing surface. Well, I'm glad I caught that in the beginning so I could patch it before I later uh, went into doing other things. Um, examining the scene tree structure. This is where we're going to take time to look at how the various components are organized. Are they grouped? Are the parent-child relationships? Is it complex? Is it simple? Um, and then once I, I familiarize myself with the layout of the various uh, scene tree, I then look at the scale and the scene units. And by scale, I mean, does the model look like it's the right size? If it's coming in at 0.2 by 0 0.04 by 0 0.06 millimeters, we've got a problem on our hands, okay? We've got a, this, you know, so we need, to, we need to fix that because, or understand why it's doing that, because if we get to the point where we start working with textures, how many people have tried to scale a texture down to 0 0.00004 mil, you know, that type of thing happens, or for some reason you're, you're increasing it by like 100 times, it, you know. There, usually that happens when we are, um, have an issue when it's converting from like uh, units from like a millimeter to a, a meter or a kilometer in some cases. Um, this just creates problems downstream, especially when we get into things like lighting, because light has a certain way of decaying over distance and fall off. And, and, and there's various things that you know, we have to pay attention a little bit to the laws of physics. And if we do things at the wrong scale, things will behave very strangely. And it just helps to make sure that we are scaled properly and that we're in a good unit. And last but not least, I want to talk about tessellation, which is um, when we import, we choose our tessellation. This, when we are taking a CAD file and turning it into um, going from NURBS data to a, a mesh, it's going to then choose what density those little triangles that are that compose our surfaces, it decides how big those are and, and therefore how smooth that surface looks once we get it in a key shot. We've ever seen faceted surfaces, that's because our tessellation was too low. So I'm gonna now go over to key shot so we can talk about this first step, the scene audit. And then I'm also going to import a model here. So let's go ahead and bring my window down a little bit. And then if I look in the files here, these are all files. We'll make these files available to you guys. We'll send you a download link later um, so you can reference all this stuff on your own. Uh, if I go to my geometry, I'm going to pull in this camping stove. If you did see the animation workshop I did earlier, it's the same model. Uh, but I'm going to be working on creating a different image here. So um, if we wanted, we can change our tessellation quality here with this slider here. So 0.2 is the default, and I usually leave this at default, and I usually check import NURBS because this means if we are importing um, a CAD model, we can later retessellate on a part-by-part -part basis inside Keyshot. So we could bring the whole thing in low and then retessellate higher as needed, keeping performance as high as possible. Okay, so I'm going to hit import, and that's going to take a moment. Um, and uh, cool. So the other thing I'm going to do is, um, yeah, while that's importing, um, we might find that um, 
you know, different, I will, I will mention this, different programs are going to offer different tessellation densities at import. Um, generally, if you're coming from SolidWorks or Fusion 360, um, you know, uh, your default import's gonna be fine. I know there are a few programs out there that do require you to kind of crank those settings up. Um, if anyone has used those programs, I know if, for a fact SolidWorks has this uh, kind of um, tessellation quality inside the program. I like to bring that all the way right to the red zone before I, I save it as like a step file or a parasolid. Um, I'll also mention that we can import native CAD as well. Um, cool, so this has taken a little bit longer um, to import than usual. I'm not quite sure why, I'll have to look at that. But nonetheless, that's gonna depend on the complexity of the model as well as if you have it import with accurate tessellation. Um, that will uh, give you the, uh, um, it will essentially kind of optimize that. So, okay, so we've got our, our scene open. If we look to audit it, we would basically say, do we see any issues or anomalies? The answer is no. We look at the scene tree, we've got a gas can, which has, looks like just a couple parts to it, surfaces. Uh, we have our camping stove, which has actually quite a uh, fairly detailed um, kind of an assembly. It's got a bunch of sub-assemblies within it. That's where most of the complexity of this model is. And then we have this pot holder assembly. It looks like this upper half is a little bit different. And then we have the burner. Um, oh, those are all inside the camping stove. Sorry about that. And then we have our, our caddy, this little uh, plastic container that this thing folds up and fits inside. Okay. And then last but not least, we can find out our scene units and the scale by clicking on the top level assembly. Within that, underneath our scene tree, we see the properties. We see it's 115 by 185 by 198 millimeters. So yes, I want it in millimeters, and yes, that sounds to be about the correct scale. So they all check out as far as I'm concerned. Uh, back on over to the presentation, let's see. There we go, okay. So next we're going to compose our scene. So this should not take too long, but this is where we're gonna decide where things belong. Okay, so this is going to, um, so we've got to be intentional. I want us to be intentional at every step of the way. So we are composing a scene because we have a purpose. So we should define that. In my case, I'm thinking, in this, in this one, I'm kind of thinking of creating like an advertisement, kind of like you'd see in a magazine. So it's not a catalog shot with a white background, and it's not something, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not something too abstract and like artsy. It's, it's almost like I would envision this set up in a mall and like a little store display, but it's, you know, so, um, you know, it's going to show that this is a, a stove that folds up. It's got, it's very compact. It's got a small container. We can see that this thing fits inside this other thing. We can see it disassembled. We can see it assembled and in context. So I just thought of what I wanted to convey. And when someone looks at this, they should be able to tell the story. It's, it's a small camping gadget that packs down and it has a nice little carrying case and it, and it attaches to the stove like this. Um, and then the, the other things I think of very much in the beginning on composition is what's your focal point? You know, that's this big red thing up front here. Um, considering the rule of thirds, I've kind of got the rule of thirds going on. Center, uh, my focal points on the right hand side. So it's, asymm it's asymmetrical. I want to avoid close cropping. So I either want to crop the image where I'm, I'm, I'm cropping my product or I want to give it room to breathe, but I don't want the bottom of my stove to come right up to the edge of the frame. So I don't want um, tangents and I don't want close cropping. Um, and then I'm, I wanna be comfortable with white space. So I wanna have some room um, around the object that's not being filled with distractions. Um, so moving on, uh, oh, I should say real quick, avoiding tangents, that's when two lines kind of come and converge or almost converge. Here's a perfect example. See how this uh, stage behind us comes right up against this line back here? Very distracting. There's another tangent where this line on this edge lines right up with the edge of this gas can. Very distracting. So those are things that I fix later because I, I realized they were no good. So we want to think about that. So bouncing back over to Keyshot to compose our scene, here's a few quick tricks that I would follow. So first and foremost, in, in this other example, I knew I wanted to have a version of my camping stove disassembled in, or, or kind of laying down in the background. So what I did is I started by creating a different model set that would include that same, the, the, the foldable stove and the caddy that it, it, it packs down into. 
I didn't want the um, gas can with that. So I basically created a new model set and I called this one um, stove on side. And actually, I did that a little too fast. Let me do that again. Um, I want to do that one and I don't want to include the camping, uh, the gas can. So I'm going to turn that off. Do stove on side. Okay, so now this will create that new model set and that, that stove dis or the gas can disappears. And then basically what I would do is um, fold this thing up and set it on its side. Now, given that we only have uh, 45 more minutes to get through the entire demo, there's no way I can recreate that entire scene, so I'm sorry about that. I won't be able to do it in real time, but I will show you a few tricks. Okay. So one thing is when making selections, if you haven't learned yet, you can hold shift, left click drag from left to right, and if you make a box around everything, what's inside that box will be selected. And if you go the other direction, anything you cross through will be selected. So pretty helpful. Other things, we've got Control D or Command D if you're on a Mac to initiate the move tool, which is very helpful now. Um, so we can basically take this guy and move this off to the side, snap it to the ground. And let's say I want to move this over here and do the same thing with this guy. So now that I've moved those kind of off to the side, the other thing that I can do is go ahead and add some other shapes just to compose an image. So I, I can go to uh, my, I'm going to take a second to close my Studios tab. I had that open from the previous demo. Okay, so I'm going to go to my Edit, Add Geometry, and we can add all these primitive shapes. And this is interesting. Uh, this is a nice way to just add more, just, you know, this is just a way to block in your scene, essentially. So I can add a cube, which doesn't seem very useful, but I can use my scale tool. And I can scale this guy up quite a bit, snap it to the ground. I can stretch it, so do a non-uniform scale. I can stretch it down. I can um, snap it to the ground. And uh, you know, I can then throw this, say, behind my model. And I basically just uh, followed this uh, step, you know, um, Command-1 or Control-1 adds a cube. And I just basically followed this step a few more times to really create a composition that I thought was kind of cool. So you don't want to go crazy and have tons of random shapes and stuff in the background, but a few might, you know, do you some good to situate or add some context. And then I'll do, um, I'll do a ground plane, or uh, I'll add a plane and then rotate that on its side to give us a backdrop. So I'll rotate it. You can hold shift when you rotate to snap. And then I can scale it a little bit. There we go. Snap to ground and move it back. There. So we have kind of a stage, so to speak. And then if I really want both of my model sets on, I can turn on the default one and we've got this guy up front. So maybe I'll turn I'll go into my scene tree and I'll turn off, basically I'll click on this guy to locate him and then I'll turn off the caddy so it's no longer visible. And then I'll take this assembly, draw a big box around it, and then I'll just move this so we have a family of products over here. A little bit further over, okay. And I'll throw this in performance mode because uh, it seems to be lagging a little bit, okay. And then finally, I'll add a ground plane, ground plane with Control G. And just to make this simple, I'm going to link those materials. Okay, perfect. So now this is where we've blocked in our scene. We've got a few basic shapes. We're kind of deciding how we want things to look, where the camera goes. Nothing too crazy, but just something to get us started. Um, okay, so back on over here. So we've composed our scene. Next thing we're going to talk about lighting. And this is huge because Lighting is a big missed opportunity. So if you guys happen to sit in on Esben's lighting um, masterclass, then you should have seen um, a lot of cool things to give you some good ideas. This is where you're going to put those ideas into practice. So first, again, intentionality. What type of lighting is appropriate? So for me, in this example, I kind of wanted 
Um, uh, to me, this was a, an interior or kind of a man-made or a person-made staged photo shoot. This is not like sitting on a picnic bench outside, but it's also not like a studio shot where it's going to go in a catalog. I have, it's kind of a hybrid. So I'm thinking almost like this would be in a, a on a display within a, a store, and therefore the light source would be man-made or like an LED or a, a, you know, a manufactured light source. Because of that, that means I would be able to be very directional with it instead of just like daylight that just seems to be everywhere. I can have a sharp direction and I can make it more dramatic to play up the scene. So I, I believe it or not, I really thought about that for a while and said, okay, that's kind of where I feel like I might be within the light. And then I decided, is this going to be an image-based environment or lighting or is this going to be physical light? So that means image-based lighting is our HDRIs. Those are great at giving us kind of this big global, evenly distributed light or using physical lights to be kind of have the opposite effect. I wanted some dark spots and I wanted some, I wanted a very directional light source in this case. So I said, definitely I'm going with physical lights. Now it's not an either or, you can do both. So in this case, what I often do is I will make my physical lights the main light source and I will bring my HDRI down to like 0.1 or even 0.01 and use that as a fill, believe it or not. And that helps reduce the noise a little bit. So the next thing to think about here is the use of shadows. So many people think a well-lit object is, a, is an object that has no shadow or a scene that has no shadow in it. But if you emphasize every beat as a drummer, you're emphasizing nothing. So let's not overlight our scenes. Let's be intentional and directional with our light if we can. And that is going to help describe surface and form much better than if we don't. And then finally, try to achieve a full range of light and darks. Really challenge yourself to get almost too bright in some areas and too dark in some areas, and then work your way back down toward a happy medium. Most people have just too gray of an image. It just lacks contrast. So let's go and set up a light and key shot here. So if I get over here to key shot, ah, okay. So I'm gonna add a light, a physical light, just like I did before. I'm gonna add a plane, so I'll do uh, edit. Add geometry and I'm going to choose a plane and um, here's an interesting thing I've noticed if I add a plane and I have two model sets on it'll copy it or insert it into both model sets so momentarily I'm going to turn one of them off so it doesn't place two planes in my scene edit add geometry and then add a plane uh -huh. and then I'm going to drag this guy up into the ceiling over the side rotate it a little bit, and then scale it down just a bit. Okay. And then I'll turn on the rest of my geometry. And then this guy right here, this is going to be one of my, uh, this is going to be my light source. So what I'll do is I'll double click on it, and I'm going to change it from diffuse to an E. Nope, never use emissive for your physical lights, unless they are just like a, dis like a glowing display or something. If we want to illuminate a space, we're going to use something like a, an area light. Okay, and now in performance mode, we're not going to see the effects of this, so I'm going to have to leave performance mode. I'm going to go into product mode here and see how it looks. We don't see much because it's not super bright, and our HDRI is pretty well turned up. So I'll start by taking my environment, my HDRI, and basically almost bringing it down to nothing. I'll do 0.1, and you can see it's still pretty bright. So I'll do 0 0.05, and at 0 0.01, there we go. And now we can see the effects of my area light. The other thing I'll do is I'll make sure it's not pointing out the back side of this light. So I'll go ahead and double click on it, not have it come out the back. There we go. So it's just one direction. And then if we want, we can make it invisible to the camera. I only turn that off though if it's in my scene. Um, otherwise, it, it doesn't need to be turned off. Um, also, visible in reflections is actually pretty handy because if we turn it off, it will. It, it will turn, it will keep the scene illuminated. But once we start putting real materials on here, we actually want to see some of our environment reflected in it. And therefore, it's helpful to have visible and reflections. So once we apply some more specular materials here, we'll probably want one or two of our light planes reflected in it, because that's what happens in the real world. And last but not least, one of my favorite things that um, that's fun to do with this is once you've got a light like this and you want to position it, Go ahead and get the move tool and choose your pivot for this light 
to be the center of your scene or the center of the object that is your hero, the hero of the shot. So for me, it's like this main stove. So I'd say pick and I would click the middle of the stove and that's now the pivot for this light. So I can play around and it's just going to chase that, ob it stays trained on that object. Even if I want to do it like this, I can do this and it stays focused on my model. And anyone who was in the animation course, you saw that you can then animate that light, which is pretty rad too. So for me, this is a fast way to hone in. And then that way I can keep my camera trained on my scene. And I can just play with these handles to then position the light to where I start to get an interesting composition. So for me, if I want something more dramatic than the shot that I showed you before, maybe I want something like this, where I have a heavy shadow that plays an important role in the scene and I want the light to be fairly low, kind of like this little guy casts a big shadow. I don't want really to get all meta, meta about that, I don't know. But um, you can kind of have some sort of like concept that you're telling for your campaign or whatever that you then play up with light. So uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm a pretty big nerd about that. So for now, what I'm gonna do, since I don't want to bounce back and forth changing my, my cameras, while I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new camera and save that, and I'll just call this one Render and just lock it down so I can always return to that, okay? All right, bouncing back into, uh, well, you know what? We haven't locked down our lighting because obviously our light is really dull. We wanna brighten it up. So let's find our light. So I've got a bunch of stuff in here. I can do a, a sort by light, and this will find my plane very quickly. So you can filter the scene tree by lights, which is a great hack. So let's make our color um, much closer to white I don't want a ton of color in there, but I do want it to be a little warm. And then it's not bright enough, so let's crank this on up to like, let's do 3,000. Okay, we're getting pretty good. That's probably good enough. So now let's go back to our um, presentation. Okay, ah, here's the other trick. So why and how did I get this one to look all grayscale when the one we're working with is very colorful? This is a, a, another interesting thing you can do, is um, just to test this scene out, what I did is I created another model set and I did this one and I called it, um, you know, occlusion or white or whatever you want to call it. And I essentially copy everything into this model, uh, model set. But here's the important part. Make sure you unlink materials because we're going to use this as a white model set. So I'll hit OK. And then um, what did I do? Where is... Where is that? Let's find out where my camera went. Ah, okay, so for whatever reason, I, oh, look at that. Um, I only have my plane in here, and if I, yeah, that doesn't look so good. Let's redo that, let's redo that one, okay. Okay, so um, I have everything on My plane landed on the ground. I don't know that that's supposed to happen. Let's try that one more time. I'm going to go ahead and move this plane back up in the sky. That was very strange. Actually, maybe that is where I had it. I just happened to do something wrong. Let's try this again. So I'll go white. And let's make sure I'm copying everything in to this new model set. Should be okay. Does it do it again? Okay, for some reason that one worked and it didn't before. I'm going to go ahead and now find my material. I'm on a white diffuse, interior diffuse white. If I go ahead and collapse all these, basically what I want to do is select everything except for my light, which is going to be, is it this plane? Or this one? There we go. So I want everything except for the one that's acting as my light to be linked. Here, show all parts. Turn this guy off. There we go. So I've got everything selected except for the light. I'm going to go ahead and drag this material onto them. So they all change at once and now they're all linked together. So what I can do is I can use this model set and go back to my saved camera just to assess it if I have a, a plain white 
material on everything. So now I'm only focusing on light instead of being distracted by the colors of the model. So I do this as well, usually, um, just to work out my thumbnails and my lighting compositions. Okay. So the next step here is to render out a scene. So we're already at a rendering phase. And um, in this case, I returned to the one that had the colors in there just so I could kind of visually see the different parts. Um, that's not totally necessary, but um, I did know that this focal point here would be red and all these would be kind of some metallic sort of paints or um, materials. And then the background, I wanted to kind of fade away. So basically, when you're at this first stage of rendering, you're going to look at your real-time render settings, um, decide kind of what those are going to be, choose an aspect ratio, meaning how high and how, like, what's the width to height of your image. Make sure everything is composed in it because you should know early on where it's going to be placed, whether it's going a, it's a digital or a print or if it's a banner or wherever it's going to end up. And just find out if the scene is going to be particularly slow or problematic to render. Um, you may not be able to find all that out this early on, but I like to at least get an idea of what my lighting setting will be. For me in this case, it'd probably be product. And if I look at some of my lighting here, I might say, you know what, 14 ray bounces is probably on the high side since I'm not going to have any transparent materials. It's not going to be that complex of a scene. So I can probably bring these down a little bit, maybe do like six ray bounces, shadow quality of two or three. You know, do I need caustics? I don't need caustics. Try the difference between interior and product mode and see if you like the way one looks compared to the other. Uh, for those who don't know the difference, um, product mode and uh, lighting, or sorry, interior mode, they're mostly going to differ in the way the lighting and sampling is, is um, done. It's just a little bit different. And um, in this case, it may take longer for certain shadows to resolve, but it may take care of noise better than the other one. So there's pros and cons to each, but, um, you know. So at this point, yeah, I would do, I would do a render and take a break. Um, and, well, before I take a break, I would mark up my image. So this is where you're basically saying, okay, first pass, how do I feel about it? This is where you take a, take a walk, grab a coffee, um, print out your image if it's going to be, you know, going, if it's going to finally be printed, put it on a wall, send it to some friends you trust, basically, get their biggest critiques. And it may seem weird to ask for feedback or for even for you to analyze a rendering before you've even put a realistic material on there. You're probably thinking I'm absolutely crazy for this. But the goal here is to really just see how quickly you can get through this first phase, but focus on the things you're likely to overlook, like the lighting and the composition. Those are the main things we're trying to nail down here. And does it tell a story, meaning is there still a focal point? That type of thing. And so here I marked up saying this yellow between these two caddies, there was a tangent here I didn't like. I didn't like how the shadow wasn't sure if it, where it met the corner of this. I didn't like that this stove was uh, so far back so I, I would move it up. I didn't like the tangents here. Um, I wanted, you know, parallel lines it looks like or something and I, you know, there's another tangent here. So I made notes to myself. Um, okay, so that's phase one. Not the most exciting, not the most glamorous, but again, you should get through it very quickly, and you should be able to try two or three of those, ideally, and then pitch those, and then pursue the strongest one, ideally. Uh, so we're about halfway through time-wise, um, so I'm going to have to pick it up a little bit. So, Okay, so this is where we get more, uh, it gets a little more fun. We get to start playing with materials, and this is where we're going to apply our basic materials. Basic means grab it from the Keyshot library and put it on and don't start tweaking. Just put on the thing that is the closest match that's in the library and then move on. Again, we're trying not to spend time on this yet. This is where we're basically making sure we don't have a scene tree of diffuse materials. We want to have things like metals, glass, paint, plastic, translucent, whatever type of materials we're going to end up using for the final materials, we want to put that type of material into our scene. And Ideally, we want to work small and get an idea of whether or not our scene is working as a thumbnail. So if I move on over the key shot and I go back to my other, turn on my other um, model sets, this is why I have this crazy clown colored looking scene is because everything that's a different material gets a different color in CAD, basically. That's how I work. 
So now if I want to put a, a paint red, you know, I just search for keywords and I can throw this on there. Okay, I want red on that. And then if I want, you know, if I know I'm going to texture something here, I might put red that's been textured. Um, if I want uh, metal or chrome for the arms there, I would search for a polished chrome. Oops, spelling things wrong. Um, I would put on basic materials, um, and I don't want you know I don't want to worry about textures yet, just the plain materials. Uh, maybe I want to do a rough aluminum for the windshield, and then maybe I want a, a rough steel for this uh, center column, and then maybe I want a um, rough uh, brass for something else. Again, rough is okay. Yes, it's got kind of it's sort of like a texture, but it's uniform. You you don't have to worry about mapping roughness really. Um, and then okay, I'll just do one more. I'll 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 search for a, a polished steel. Okay, so I've got the main materials on here, and then I might um, do duplicates of some materials. And now here's the other thing you might be noticing is that the things that we made chrome or highly polished, they're black at this point. Why are they black? Anyone know? Yeah, yeah, good, good. So a highly specular material is going to reflect its environment. And my HDRI is all but black. It's very close to black. So it's reflecting that darkness. So we will later have to do one of two things. We'll have to make it less specular or more rough with more diffuse reflections. Or we need to give it something to reflect, like a little panel behind our camera. So photographers might use like a little bounce, like a white sheet or thing. So those are things we might have to do. Um, but at this point, the other thing I said is work small. So if I go to my image and I go to, um, let's set an aspect ratio, because I didn't do that before. I'll do 16.9. Okay. And the other thing is what I'm going to do is scale this guy down. And I'll go to image, lock resolution, go back to full screen. Now this keeps Keyshot running faster, rendering faster, as well as keeps me from looking at this image super, super big and getting pulled into the details. It keeps me focused on the, the, the big picture, you know, keeping it small. Whew. Okay, so we've done that. Now we start getting into textures. And this is where the you know we really start making things look realistic. And this is a slippery slope because we've all probably done this, and we probably all know that we can spend a lot of time trying to match textures, right? Um, the little disco ball splotches there, that's because in this, I was testing whether or not I wanted caustics on in this rendering, and it turns out I chose not to because it did not add much to my scene. But there are absolutely times when a selling point of an image is the beautiful caustics on the ground. Think of like perfume bottles and stuff that might cast, or a, a wedding ring or something would cast beautiful caustics. That's part of the scene. In this case, I had metal in there. I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll need it, but then it turns out I didn't. So um, again, you kind of be willing to experiment and, and do things quick and not worry about making things precious that you can't change. So the next thing that we would talk about here is when trying to match our textures, um, photo references. If you've been in any other uh, workshops, you've probably heard other people mention references. So I will make sure I have high quality references to match textures because again, you think you know what it looks like, but when you really start looking at photo references, you notice lots of details you probably overlooked. <laughs> match things like the exact color or the specularity or bump maps or dust and imperfections. And, um, and this little footnote here, the last step here, I say it can be useful to use a studio HDRI. So what do I mean by that? So if I'm going to go ahead and start working on textures, this is where I may break my own rule and not work small anymore because I do want to get fairly close to the objects. So I may go to image and unlock my resolution. And if I go to resize my window a little bit, it'll expand back up. And if I make sure that I'm in my free camera, my camera's currently locked, I think. Let's see. Yeah, it's locked. There's a keyboard shortcut that you probably didn't know. You can switch to a free camera without going back to this tab. Control Shift F bumps us to the free camera. So I will work going back and forth between my free camera and my locked camera. And so the first thing I notice is this guy's too glossy. I want to bring the roughness up to say 0.1.
but maybe more than just roughness, I want to add an actual bump texture as well. So I can go to my textures, go into my bump channel for this material. Use a procedural texture whenever you can because it's going to always map perfectly. It's also got an infinite resolution and um, they're free and built into Keyshot. So you don't have to like manage that as a separate image file. So I can go to um, add a noise texture and we see it gives us this ripply effect. And I can just scale that guy down. And again, this is more or less just for example. I'm not trying to create a photoreal image uh, for the demo today, but I might do that. And then maybe for this guy over here, it's got that same texture and I kind of like that. Okay, that works. Let's look at some of my other items here. So these guys, these arms, I'm going to try uh, adding some roughness to see what happens. That brightens them up a little bit, but they also get very noisy, so we have to be careful about that. Um, Maybe I want to do, uh, let's see, if I want, I could go into my textures and I could find something like uh, one of my favorite textures that we ship with Keyshot. It's an old one called uh, Friction. I use this one all the darn time. Um, it it kind of looks like, just like a scratch surface, but I do use this uh, very often. But in order to get it to show up where I want it to, I might have to use the material graph. Um, because I want to use this as a roughness texture. So I might plug this into roughness. Mm, that's interesting. So what's it doing? Um, if you haven't used roughness textures before, I'm going to preview it. You can hit C while in the material graph on a node to preview the, rough, uh, the color information of a texture. What this is doing is it's showing us how that is being mapped. And um, I can go in and you know maybe scale it down a little bit. And um, I don't want to scale it down so much that I see big seams or see where it repeats. Um, and then what the idea, what, what this is doing is, this is this gets into some advanced stuff, so I'm going to gloss over this. But basically what this is doing is the white area is going to be very rough and the darker areas are going to be less rough. So I can go ahead and say it's a little too bright and I can go to the color and just drag it down so it's more subtle. So if I get out of this preview, we can see it goes away, but then if I increase the brightness, it starts to come back and that texture shows. Um, but yeah, we just kind of, you know, start going through and adding textures and changing materials and color. Like we don't want this to be diffuse. I might make this, maybe I do want it diffuse. Maybe I want it to reflect um, some of my environment. So maybe I'll switch it to plastic and see how it gets too shiny now. Maybe to overcome the shininess, I will just add some roughness and now it behaves more like a matte plastic. And one of the nice things about using physical lights <clears throat> and, and a, a material like this is we see how the light's brighter over here and then it fades out. It behaves more like a real light instead of just be, being evenly lit like an HDRI. So then I can snap back to my saved render camera and I see how I can use that light on the background as a compositional element creating this hot spot. Maybe it's a little too bright so I could take my specular value of that material and decrease it a bit. So it's not, it's not competing visually with the rest of that. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff we can do here. Hopefully uh, we're seeing a lot of opportunities. So after textures, what we want to do is assess whether or not we need to adjust samples on our materials. And in this case, I had a lot of metal materials in this scene and I'm using a physical light. Anyone who's tried to measure, I'm sorry, not measure, anyone who's tried to render a scene where you've got lots of metals with physical lights, you've probably found that this is a total pain in the butt because it gives you a lot of those white hot pixels. Um, this is where you really uh, can, can rely on material samples to try to help. You can go into your physical light, which is our plane. So if I filter by lights again, I can find my plane and double click it. There's a sample setting, it's set to nine. I might put that all the way up to like 24. Um, that's on the high side, but you know, I wanna err on the side of safety in this case. And then if I'm getting a lot of noise here, I can double click on this material and see the roughness underneath there. I can switch my samples from 16 to say 22 or something. And just by boosting those here and there, you can try to cut down on the amount of noise you get. Um, the other thing that you can do, as I showed in my image, was a region render. So you can go to your image tab and enable region. Or anyone who's, who prefers hotkeys, we don't need to go to the image tab. We can hit 
Control Shift R pops up the region box, and you can scale this guy down. And I can say, hey, the corner of this is pretty noisy. I want to see how long this has to sit before this looks less noisy. So how do I assess what that number is? If I hit H on the keyboard, there's a heads up display in the corner. This is telling me it's at 220, 240, 250, 260. So those are samples going up as time passes. And if I adjust my camera at all, if I went to my free camera and change my angle, it resets and it starts counting up again. So what you do is you basically see how long it takes for it to look good and then see what that number of samples is at. That's going to tell you how long or how many samples you should render at to get that material to look less noisy. So I can kind of go through my scene and see what areas are the worst, the biggest offenders, and the ones that take the longest or the most number of samples, I can try to bump up their material samples to compensate for that so that when I do my final rendering, I don't need as many screen samples to render out. Um, if you're pretty new to Keyshot, this is getting into the territory of you know, more advanced. Um, but again, I want to cater to everyone in the room here. So, all right, so I get rid of my region render. Okay. And basically, I'm just, I'm just trying to, again, get a feel for, is this going to be a pain in the butt to render? What are, your, what are the materials that are going to be the most problematic through this, this process? And um, cool. So I'm, I'm you know, optimizing those material samples if necessary. So then this is where I go ahead and do another rendering and take a break. So at this point, we've blocked in our scene, we've dialed in our composition and our lighting, and then we've gone ahead and done a rendering, taken a break, and then we've gone back and marked up our image, and then we went ahead and responded to all the things we didn't like on the first pass, and then we put real materials in, then we textured them, then we dialed in in material samples, and now we did a second rendering. So We've taken our second pass. Things are starting to look very good. At this point, we should have um, a pretty nice image. If this was our stopping point, we should be OK. And something I didn't mention before is ideally, even before we go to final materials, if this is all we had time to do was this was get to this phase right here, no, we don't really want to show this. But at this point, you could still technically present this, and somebody could still understand your intention here. That's the idea. Is, we want to lock in our image and get it to the point of where we can convey the intention while spending the least amount of time. So at this point here, we've done our second rendering. We take our break. And now we're in our last phase. This is the refine phase. Okay. Whew. We take a quick coffee break. Okay. So this is where we're going to get really, really nasty and critical. Um, we have to pass a few tests before our rendering is done. For me, there are three tests that I like to do every time. It's the thumbnail test, first and foremost. So again, if you don't come from a background of design or art or anything like that, a thumbnail is usually referred to a small sketch or an image. So bring it down to like a smartphone, maybe a business card size, or a postage stamp. If you can scale it all the way down there and still see what you're looking at and make sense of the image, it passes. That's for sure. Bottom left, that's my thumbnail. Does it pass? I said yes. I could still see every element and it made sense visually. Next, I had the great, oh, before I pass on. If it does not pass the, great, uh, the, the thumbnail test, it probably needs better comp composition or better contrast or both. Because if it's too busy, there's too much going on, or the composition doesn't make sense, it's hard to read that. Next, we have the grayscale test. And that's where I bring a copy of... I mean, you could do it in Keyshot, but I usually just take a screenshot or that, that last rendering I did. I bring it into Photoshop. I just desaturate it 100% so it's got no color. And I step away from the monitor and I say, can I read it? And that's great, but um, usually what I find is almost everybody's renderings lack full tonal range, meaning the brightest brights from the darkest darks, they're lacking. So in this case, what you want to be able to do is have pure whites and pure blacks or close to it. And that's going to give you enough contrast to read the image fully. Uh, a lot of us tend to um, misinterpret saturation or color and vibrance as contrast. But it turns out if you desaturate it, you can have, two, like, you can have a red and a green that could not be further from colors from each other, but they can be the exact same value. And therefore, as a grayscale, they can blend in together. And what we're looking for is full-on tonal contrast. Okay. 
So revisiting lighting or increasing the contrast values, not the hue, in the actual colors or materials, that's what I would do. So in my case, mine did not pass the grayscale test. It was just too gray. So then the next thing was the focal point test. So this is where you ask somebody to, to say, what's the most important part of this image? In this case, I had the conflicting red mass on the left-hand side and then the red canister in the, on the right-hand side. They, in my mind, were competing for my attention. They were so, they were the only things that had color and they were jumping forward and it was just too aggressive. So I decided mine failed that one as well. So in my case, to create a focal point, you might need to move something further away from the camera or closer to the camera. You may need to slightly adjust the value or the color. You may need to um, use depth of field to blur something out that's less important. Um, you could use a vignette. There's a lot of things you can do to enforce a focal point. You can even use composition and like the direction of wh where things are pointing. So anyway, you do your final critique and you try to pretend it was somebody else's image, not your own, because we tend to love the things we create. Um, so okay, so now that we've done that, we need to um, do our final rendering. So at this point, we can we can you know say this was our final image. We did our we did our composition. We did our um, we cr you know we did our uh, critique. We we decided what passed, what failed, um, and then we go back and we fix those. Of course, so this is this kind of back and forth, and and in this case, our final rendering is going to be. Um, is going to be the largest possible resolution we would need this as. So if we know this may be viewed full screen on a retina display, we may want a 5K image. Um, if we know it's never going to be greater than 1080p, then we don't need to render more than 1920 by 1080. So just know what it's going to be used for. Then for greatest flexibility, if you render to uh, a TIFF, which is a 16-bit image, or TIFF32 or PSD, those are going to be images that support transparency and they're going to have a greater um, range of tones that you can play with to push and pull the highlights and the contrast and the shadows. Um, choose render passes. Those are render passes and render layers are going to help you um, get extra images out of Keyshot that you can use like a clown pass and things like that to do further editing. Um, and then if you're creating an animation, make sure you render out your frames. And then if you, uh, and then grab a drink, of course, water, coffee, alcohol, or all three. Um, but anyway, so the point here is that um, between this step of final critique and final render, I, I kind of skipped this, I'm sorry about this, but between the final critique and the final render, I actually took my own, based on the results of the final critique, I went in and then made those changes to my final render. So if you're really good at catching small details, you might notice that the red things that were competing on the left, I desaturated and they became more grayish, the less vibrant, so this could stand out. Um, you know, and I, I pushed and pulled some things so I had greater highlights and greater, you know, darker darks, basically. Okay, so we do that final rendering. Is it done? Well, if you have time to keep playing with it, the answer is no. But if you have to turn it in, of course it's finished. Um, in this case, I wanted to do some post-production, and if we, this is where we really go that last step to make things look complete. You can see that even though this image and this image don't seem to differ very much, they certainly differ a fair bit in that um, I went into an, a photo editing program and I really just finessed it. This is kind of the cherry on top. So your photo editing program ideally is something that supports 32-point float, and what that means is uh, something like a uh, Adobe Lightroom. If you've ever shot photos with a camera like a DSLR um, it, that's capable of producing a raw image, a raw image tends to look kind of gray and dull until you bring it into a photo editing program that allows you to, again, push and pull the, um, the, the values to really uh, distribute the, the brights and darks. Um, there's a few other programs I mentioned there that are, are useful. Photoshop is old enough, believe it or not, that it doesn't even support full editing of 32-bit images. So you have to generally go down to 16-bit sometimes. Um, also, tone mapping to avoid overly dark or bright areas. Uh, tone mapping is a rabbit hole of its own, but you know you can look that up on your own time. Adjust curves. Kill the fireflies, uh, specifically the white pixels, not the little flying guys. But 
oftentimes we get sparkly white bright pixels and um, there's there's all sorts of good tutorials online you can check out to see how to do that um, and then final effects such as grain LUTs which are lookup tables uh, vignettes bloom flare all these little things you can do to get a little more pop okay and then finally export as your 8-bit image whether it's JPEG or a smaller resolution of the final image so that's where I ended up with this image by following those steps to a T. And the final editing I did here, if we look back at this image, the final render versus this, I brightened it up a fair bit. I pushed and pulled the contrast. I crushed the blacks a little bit so it goes to pure black in some areas. And then um, I had some areas where the light would be hitting um, the bits here. And I kind of added just a little bit of bl uh, bloom and glare like right here and on some of these little bits it's very very subtle and then I, I denoised it took out some fireflies and things and that's pretty much all um, the highlights became a little more yellow I've got this kind of vintage look here the other thing is I made sure that my um, background was a color that then complemented or worked with this red um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what tone this background color should be and to me it ended up being this kind of bluish color so Anyway, those are the steps. Quickly review the three-pass technique. We've got block in, lock in, and refine. And the big kind of takeaway here is that anyone who's, who's you know, looking closely, the block in should be fast. 20 minutes, 30 minutes maybe, just really fast, quick and dirty. But make sure you treat the things most people overlook with care. These are things like composition, um, intention, your light, your shadows, things like that. And then when we lock it in, for me, I spent probably about an hour locking in, doing things like some textures, choosing samples, doing a render, giving it a critique, deciding what to tweak. And then finally, the refine phase, believe it or not, took well, way more than two, maybe three times of those other ones combined. This is where, you know, scale it down to a thumbnail. Does it pass the gray scale test? Does it pass the focal point test, doing your final rendering, post-production, um, really it's just you end up spending almost exponentially more time to just incrementally increase the quality. Um, so the reason I suggest doing the three-pass technique is because if you do it each time, you'll get really good at knocking out the most important aspects in the beginning. Because the, to the person in the very back of the room, these three images probably look fairly close to one another. They're probably not substantially different, which means you can pitch something, you could pitch five or 10 examples of this first level of quality, and it's enough for a client or your boss to say yes or no before you go down a rabbit hole of six or 10 hours creating something that they say, no, it doesn't work because this is now competing with this. Let's make mistakes quick and dirty in the beginning so we can then be very sure that we're on a final direction before we noodle all these little um, final details. So again, I think this is something I firmly believe that, you know, it's, it's kind of this 80-20 rule. You're going to get 80% of the results or 80% the way there with just 20% of the effort in the beginning. And then the rest is just if you have the luxury of time, you dial in those details. And I think this should allow you guys to better know how long or predict how long a project might take, how long or, you know, that helps when quoting, budgeting time, budgets, all those things. So that's it. That's the three-pass technique. That's my take on the art of workflow. And I hope it's something you guys can take back home with you. Um, since we went, I think it's pretty much, I think our session's pretty much done time-wise. Um, we're at, uh, let's see. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we're right at five o'clock. So I really appreciate you guys' time and patience. Um, I know it's been a long day. Um, I'm going to hang out here for a few questions, but anyone who needs to get out there, go ahead, enjoy some sunshine, and um, I'll see you again a little bit later. Okay.